Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Two Regions Presbyterian Church. We didn't have to force anyone to come into the air conditioning. Did we? I draw your attention to. Uh, oh, there are no announcements in bulletin, but I draw your attention to the bulletin, and I received an email from Bill last night. Uh, some of you may know Dick Mason died yesterday at noon. Uh, he said he was with the family and asked me to announce that a memorial service will be held on Tuesday at 11 a.m. here at the church. There are no calling hours and a luncheon will fall. And on the back table there is a newsletter from the Senate of the Trinity some information from their silence since the Welcome Act for hate uh, meetings that have been held in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia, and they have assembled the information and put it together uh, for your reading with pleasure. Uh, it was distributed by the Upper Ohio Valley Presbytery. Are there any other announcements today? All right, let us come together in silent prayer as we open our spirits. Amen. And let us join together in our call to worship uh, found in the bulletin. Why do you boast, O mighty one, of mischief done against the godly? All day long you are plotting destruction. Your tongue is like a sharp razor, you worker of treachery. You love evil more than good, and lying more than speaking the truth. You love all words that devour, O deceitful tongue. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous will see and fear, and will laugh at the evildoer, saying, See the one who would not take refuge in God, but trusted in abundant riches, and sought refuge in wealth. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you forever because of what you have done. In the presence of the faithful, I will proclaim your name, for it is good. Our gathering hymn is immortal, invisible, God only wise, number 263.
Y'all may be seated. Now, before we have this prayer, I'm gonna, I've got to share something with you. I think there was way too much laughing and joking before the service. Do you realize, you realize if somebody wandered in and heard all that laughing and joking and visiting, they wouldn't know they were in a Presbyterian church, would they? they think they would wandered into a Methodist church. Yeah. So, uh, and remember, because remember, as good Presbyterians, are we all good Presbyterians, right, Brother Michael? We are good Presbyterians. A good Presbyterian, we can do anything we want. We just can't enjoy it. Exactly. Amen. We just can't enjoy it. And y'all were having too much joy early on. So let me see a good Presbyterian face. And if you want to know what that is, look at a picture of John Calvin. <laughs> but then he had intestinal worms, so he had good reason to look like that. Uh, we come to, to the part of service, because we're going to be here in God's Word in just a little bit, where we have the opportunity to confess our sins to God. And since we, uh, we commit sins not just as individuals, but also as communities, it's right that we pray as a community, which is the prayer that's in the bulletin, uh, that we'll do together, and then we'll follow it with just a brief time for individual and personal confession. So, brothers and sisters, as God's people, let's go before God now in prayer. Gracious God, we confess that we have sinned against you. Often we speak before we listen and act before we think. As a result, we miss the guidance you offer through your word and people. And our words and work become confused and ineffective. Gracious Lord, forgive us and help us listen first. Amen. Lord God, in the silence that follows here, these prayers we lift up to you, and Lord, have mercy upon us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for listening to us. And of course, thank you for loving us as much as you do. But right now, we thank you for forgiving us. And we know we've been forgiven. In fact, we have been cleansed because we've confessed these sins in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In his name we now pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear the good news of the gospel. This saying is sure and worthy of universal acceptance. That Jesus Christ came to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that's good. Brothers and sisters, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Amen. Please stand.
as always, very, very good. And, and Joe, what was this going over here and then coming, coming yeah, back? I usually play it on the order. Oh, I see. So you, you got the piece and moved it back here? Okay. Keyboardist, dime a dozen. <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> but do you really want a dozen of us together at one time? No, no, no. <laughs> no I wouldn't either. Okay, the uh, scripture lesson this morning comes from the gospel according to Luke, the 10th chapter beginning with the 38th verse. Now if you've got your Bibles together uh, or with you, uh, you might want to read along. If not, please feel free to use the Pew Bible. Hear the word of God as written by the evangelist Luke. As they were going, he went into a certain village. And a woman named Martha welcomed him. And she had a sister called Mary. And after she sat at the feet of the Lord, she continued listening to listen to his words. But Martha was continually dragged away by much service. After she came up to him, she said, Lord, do you care that my sister left me alone? Or, Lord, you care that my sister left me alone to serve, don't you? Then speak to her so that she might do her part with me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and disturbed concerning many things. But there is need for one thing. For Mary picked out the good portion which will not be taken from her. Amen. Praise God for this reading from his word. Let's have just a brief word of prayer. Lord God, thank you so much for giving us this time together. Inspire us all that the words that we've heard and the words that we're about to hear, that they may make a difference in the way we live. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Um, now, y'all may not know this, and I, uh, there's no way you would, uh, but twice I've been a commissioner to the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church USA. Once when I was out in Indiana and once after I moved here. Now talk about having more than 12 ministers together. It's pretty intense. Now I, I think you all know that the General Assembly is the highest earthly governmental level in our denomination. And as such, the uh, General Assembly considers rules and, and regulations and practices for the, the whole Presbyterian Church. And although each time I've attended, not all the decisions went my way, or the way I thought they should go, there was one thing about the process that I really liked. And in fact, it's something you see throughout the Presbyterian Church, and I really like it. You see, the Presbyterian Church is really slow in making changes. Now, I know that's going to come as a shock to y'all, but we are really slow at changing. And I think in a certain extent, that's a good thing. For example, almost everything we considered at the General Assembly started at Presbytery. Started, you know, at a, uh, you know, sort of a down-home level. And then it was referred to committees. And the committees met and referred it to the whole assembly. And I don't know if you know, the assembly is made up of representatives elected by different presbyteries, sort of like the House of Representatives. Only none of them are told to go home. Uh, but even when the assembly decides to make a change, even when that's a decision, it still has to go back to 177 presbyteries for their approval. And if a majority of those presbyteries say, yes, we want to make the change, the change is... Thank you. It <laughs> took a long time. So, yeah, the change is made. That is until the next General Assembly when they may scrap it all and start over again. And you thought changes in government were hard. Now, I've got to admit, sometimes this process drives me nuts. 
You know, everything takes so long. And there's a lot of times that I just wish that one guy would just stand up and say, this is what we're going to do. Don't have to worry about, don't have to worry about assemblies, don't have to worry about people. We're doing this. Make a decision fast, right? Of course, I only feel that way when he or she is going to do what? Agree with, Agree with me. Things I want them to do. Then that's okay. So sometimes that's the way I, you know, I feel about the church. Still, all things considered, I really appreciate its slowness. Which sort of reminded me of the way I played basketball. Because it simply gives everybody involved the chance to do what? Express. Express. Just slow down. Right? And maybe most important, listen for the voice of God. Speaking most clearly through Scripture, but also through the voice of His people. Of course, whether we decide to listen to that voice is ultimately up to us. But the opportunity is built into the system. And like I said, I think that's a good thing. Because I got to tell you, Americans in general and American Christians in particular seem to be a whole lot better at talking and even doing than in listening. We aren't great listeners. I mean, think about it. A lot of believers don't have any trouble telling people both inside and outside the church exactly what they should be doing, right? And exactly what they should be feeling. And exactly what they should be thinking. And a lot of folks spend hours and hours and hours talking about and sometimes even set up in, setting up programs to reach a certain group. Of people. I love it when we do that. Man, I cannot tell you how many times I, a 30 year old, no, a 60 plus year old minister, have talked to other 60 year old plus members about what teens really want in the church. I'm telling them what teens want. Like, I actually know at 62 years old. Man, my daughter listens to people on the radio. I got no clue who they are. You see, that's what we seem comfortable doing. And even though, I don't want you to get me wrong, our motives are good. The motives aren't bad, and there's really nothing wrong with the suggestions we come up with or the ideas we develop. Often what we end up saying and doing falls flat on its face. For example, that youth group that worked so well 50 years ago or that group that is booming down in my son's church in Houston, Texas. That style group may go nowhere with kids right here in the valley and right now in 2019. And all the changes we make to worship, and all the changes we make to our education programs, to reach out to young adults, often even within our congregations, what do they end up doing? Well, I'll tell you what they do. They end up ticking off some folks in the church who sincerely believe that the church should be one place in the world where things don't change. Where it's always the same. And all our suggestions about how people should live the values they should follow, the hopes and dreams they should have, even the people they should vote for. Things that we believe actually work when we announce them out there in the world on the other side of the stained glass and even among our own members, man, they seem to roll off their backs like water off a duck. In other words, sometimes it seems that all our talk and all our planning and all our motion and all our activity goes nowhere. 
We put all this energy into something and it, and it doesn't succeed. And when that happens, well that, then we start to change, don't we? Because our words stop being ideas and suggestions and start becoming grumbling and complaints, right? You know, modern young people. Alan, can you believe modern young people nowadays? They don't appreciate anything. They sure don't appreciate libraries like they used to, right? They did mine. They did yours? Well, be quiet. <laughs> uh, and families. They don't raise their kids the way they're supposed to be raised. Am I not right? Yeah, Joe agrees with me. You want to stand beside Joe? Sure. It's because we start grumbling and complaining. And instead of trying to figure out how we can be loving on bo both within and outside these walls, we spend far more time trying to find people we can blame for our lack of success. And then rather than acting with joy and enthusiasm, because we have the opportunity, I want you to get this, we have the opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ. There ain't news any better than that. And even though we know that people are going to be attracted to a positive atmosphere, we allow our frustration and disappointment with others to come to the surface. And so that everybody can know how unhappy we are with the world as it is. Because it's not the one that we want. I'll guarantee nobody wants to be a part of a complaining community. They don't want to be a member of that. I don't. But you know, that's bound to happen when we talk and act before we do anything else. As a matter of fact, we become no better than good old Martha in the story we just read. You see, Martha, if you had to describe Martha, what word would you use? Martha was a... Complainer. Well, before complaining, before complaining, what was she doing? What was Martha? She was a doer, wasn't she? She was a doer. You know, the, the one that we talk, read about in the passage? And I'll tell you, there was nothing wrong with what she was doing. You know, the Greek word that Luke uses in this passage is diakonia. Diakonia. And that was the word from which we get the English word deacon. So she was being a deacon to Jesus. And that was something really, being a deacon was something really important in the book of Acts. You know, put it another way, Martha was ministering to Jesus. That's what she was doing. That's what Luke said she was doing. She just wasn't doing random acts of kindness. She was ministering. She was addressing, trying to relieve the, the uh, pressure he was feeling. She was doing something that was good. That's what the word means. And yet, where did he get her? Where did he get Martha in the story? Luke wrote that the more she did, the more she was literally being dragged away. That's what it says in Greek. She was being dragged away from what was most important. I mean, think about it. All her work, all her service, all her ministering caused her to resent her sister, whom she felt wasn't pulling her own way. And then it led her to say something that, at least to me, would seem to be pretty appropriate when directed at Jesus. She said, Lord, you care that my sister left me alone to serve, don't you? Then speak to her so that she might do her part with me. Right? She said that to Jesus Christ. Lisa, can you believe that? To Je would you say that to Jesus? No, I wouldn't either. And finally it resulted in the Lord saying to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted concerning many things. Something that Jesus will, will specifically say we shouldn't be. We shouldn't be distracted and worried about a lot of other things. You know, like where we will sleep and what we will eat or whether the Browns will have a decent season this year. We shouldn't be. Worried and distracted by that. That's what Jesus said. 
on her service actually led Martha away from Christ. And I think the same thing can happen to us. But that wasn't the case with her sister, was it? I mean, instead of running around, Mary did what? You remember what Mary did? She sat at the feet of the Lord. And she continued to do what? Listen to His words. In other words, she did exactly what Jesus said must happen. For the good seed to take root in good soil, it's what sets his brothers and sisters apart from the rest of the world. Remember, he said, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey. And even though that irritated the pudding out of her hyperactive sister, what Mary chose to do moved Jesus to say to Martha, But there is need for one thing. For Mary picked out the good portion which will not be taken from her. And you know, I think he could say the same thing to us. When we look to Mary rather than Martha as a guide. In other words, instead of shooting first and asking questions later, maybe we should reverse the order. What do you think? Maybe we need to make an intentional effort to listen. And I'm talking to husbands and wives. Maybe we should take an intentional effort to listen. And I'm talking about listening to our neighbor and listening to one another. But most importantly, to listen to Jesus Christ first. Not after we've done what we've done, but before. Of course, that means we're probably going to have to do a few things that aren't nearly as fun as talking, right? At least they're not as fun for me. I mean, first, we're going to need to put ourselves in the position to hear, right? Which means we better take time and make the effort to read our Bibles. You want to know what God has for us? Read. We can read our Bibles. I can only think of one response to that. Duh! Duh! But more than that, man, we can attend worship services and we can attend Bible studies that do more than confirm what we already believe. You know, I really get frustrated. I really get frustrated when I hear a Christian horribly misquote Scripture. You know, twist it all around and misrepresent it and put the phrasing on it, add words to it. And he does it to tell another person what he should be doing. Before we talk, we need to go to the source so that we might know the truth. And I'll tell you, I think that applies to what we plan and do as well. If we want to do anything about concerns and needs, to me it makes sense to go to the ones who have those concerns and needs. For example, if we really care about reaching out to and helping teens, we may need to talk to somebody under the age of 50. Does that make sense? But just putting yourself in a position to hear isn't enough. Because second, I think we also need to quiet ourselves. Now I'm going to ask you a personal question. How many, of time, how many times have you been in a conversation have you been in a conversation? Other person is talking. And as the other person, you may be doing this right now. <laughs> other person is talking. And you're there sitting, you're sitting thinking about what you're going to say when it's your turn. How many times do you do that? An hour. How many times an hour do you do that? <laughs> I do it all the time. Now, you tell me, is that listening? Am I listening to that person? If we ever want to hear God or anyone else, I think we need to settle down and, and I'm saying with all with this, I'm saying this with all due respect, we need to settle down and shut up. But again, that by itself isn't enough. 
Not if we've decided to be close to what God or the other person might be saying. You see, that's number three. We've got to be intentionally open. And I'll tell you, putting yourself in a position to hear and become quiet is child's play compared to this. I know when I'm forced to hear something that I don't want to accept, I start feeling hot under my clerical collar. I start feeling hot. And you know what happens to the muscles in my face? They start to tighten. And I feel myself getting ready to do what? Pounce when it's my turn to, attack, to respond to that attack, right? You see, I think to listen, we need to be willing to hear the stuff we don't want to hear. And if we ask questions, our goal shouldn't be to debate, but rather to understand. But like I said, this kind of openness is hard. In fact, I think a lot of people would rather cut and run than do it. I mean, good gracious Marie, we, or good night nurse. I have people tell me all the time that they listen to either MS or watch either MSNBC or Fox News. Why do they do that? Watch one or the other? Yeah, it tells them the news they want to hear. Boy, I think that's a good chance to grow. What do you think? It's like being protected from a disease. Like wearing a has what is it, hazmat suits to protect you from viruses and stuff. Openness is hard. But don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we should believe everything that comes down the pike. But if we decide we're only going to listen to the stuff we want to hear, how are we ever going to hear God speaking in new ways and moving us into new directions? How are we going to hear that? I think stagnation is the best we can expect if we don't listen. But suppose we do. Suppose we seek out opportunities to hear. Suppose we quiet ourselves down. Suppose we become as open as we can. In other words, suppose we take the time to do what Mary did and sit at the feet of our Lord and listen to Him and to others. Well, I firmly believe the results are going to be worth it. I mean, just imagine how it could transform every congregation in this country if that's what we started doing. To say nothing of our marriages and our families and all the other relationships we have, including the one we have with God. Because we're listening to Him, we'll understand what God has called us to be and to do. And because we're listening to people both inside and outside the church, the words that we use and the actions that we take will finally have a focus. And the focus is going to be on who? Them, not us. We'll no longer be answering questions that nobody is asking anymore. Or spinning our wheels meeting concerns that no longer exist. Put another way, we'll no longer be continually dragged away by much service. Nor will Jesus have to say to us, you are worried and disturbed concerning many things. Instead, we'll be able to concentrate our words and our work on the will revealed in God's Word and the needs shared by our neighbors. And we'll be able to do this because like Mary, we will have picked out the good portion which will not be taken from us. And like I said earlier, this kind of listening is actually built into the Presbyterian system. Of course, we still have the choice whether we're going to do it or not. God hasn't taken away that free will. And I'll tell you, that applies to us here this morning. On one hand, we can certainly choose if for the sake of time, because the other one, this is much faster. We can start talking and we can start doing. And although doing this will give us some, you know, some kind of satisfaction, 
If that's what we choose, we really shouldn't be surprised or frustrated when our words and our acts have very little impact. And we certainly shouldn't run around looking for someone to blame. Unless that is, we happen to be walking by a mirror. But that's not our only choice. Because right here and right now, we can choose to be more like Mary than like Martha. And we can intentionally put ourselves in the position to hear and then quiet ourselves down and open ourselves up. And if this is what we choose to do, if this is what we choose to do at church, if this is what we choose to do at home and at work and at school, we just may be amazed by what happens when we listen first. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, you gave us two ears and one mouth. Maybe we should see that as a sign. Maybe we should intentionally listen. Which means putting ourselves in the place to hear and opening our minds so that we can understand. Lord God, help us to do that for the sake of your gospel and our sense of service. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Let's all stand and let's sing hymn 527, Near to the Heart of God. Please stand. Y'all may be seated. Uh, has anybody noticed that it's been hot lately? You know, uh, and I'll tell you, I've been working, working hard, uh, and I'm a little, little peckish. Do you, do you have, you, do you have any, um, any grapes I might have? Do you have a? Can you? Would you give me a grape? Okay, thank you. Okay, give me, give me a good one. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. This will keep me going. Um, 
we have the opportunity to uh, lift our prayers to God. Are there any particular needs or concerns that anybody here might have? Well, that's a good thing. Uh, that's a good thing. But I recognize that you have some, some different concerns that, that are in your heart. And so we're going to go to God now in prayer. And I'm going to open and pray for a little bit. And, and then you all have the opportunity to lift your concerns to God. And uh, we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. So let's go before God now in prayer. Lord God, before we say anything else, again, we want to thank you for giving us the time to be together this morning. It is a wonderful, wonderful privilege. Lord God, help us. Help us. Help us to listen first. Help us to listen before we start talking. Listen to you. Listen to the folks around us. Help us to listen before we start doing. Lord, open our ears and our minds and our hearts so that we might hear and understand and feel. And then allow that what we've heard and understood and felt, help that to guide our response, whether that response is in words or in work. Lord God, help us to listen first. And now, Lord, in the privacy of our own hearts, we lift up to you the concerns that we know so well. Lord God, hear us as we pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for listening to us and, and thank you for responding to us. We know that you will. You're going to be responsive to these needs because we've lifted them up to you in the name of Christ our Savior who taught us to pray, praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you all come forward to collect our offering?
that is a is a great hymn you know open my what's the first verse open my eyes open my ears eyes and ears before we ever get to mouth you know that maybe that's not a bad pattern you know maybe that's not a bad idea in fact let me let that be my charge to you Let's open our eyes and our ears before we open our mouths. What's that? (laughs) (laughs) And with that in mind, and oh, by the way, if anybody here, and I'm just throwing this out, wants some really, really sparkly purple lipstick, (laughs) mm hmm. To inspire this walk, receive the blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen.